Great. All right. So now that I think we're all together <laughs> with the whole group, let's actually. Um, so we did talk about the the meeting summary very briefly in the other <laughs> the other meeting room. Now we are actually going on to the partnership recommendations. Um, Doug did point out obviously the two changes that you see on your screen right now that are in red, and then we were actually in the middle of a conversation with um, Mayor Malay um, talking about how. Um, you know, having like a, a set of specific guidelines or rules established um, by RTD so that um, folks all understand, you know, how their proposal is going to be scored equally um, and et cetera. And then I think what you were going to jump in with your next comment. So any other comments along that strain of that conversation? Let's let's jump back into that. Could could Jackie or somebody point to what words they would change in this document to achieve that goal? Because I'm a little lost on whether or not you're editing something or adding a new bullet or which. It, it, I think it would be a new bullet, uh, Elise, because I don't okay. see a place to add it in. And so, and I apologize that it, it's been a crazy snowy Monday in May and I did not write words down. Uh, it, it's more this idea that, um, that guidelines be established to level the playing field. So communities, so local governments or interested parties know kind of what the rules are going to be to be able to partner with RTD. And, and it, you know, there's a much more eloquent way to say that. I think everybody understands the sentiment. Um, there's nothing tricky about it. It's just. So maybe cons consistent and equitable access to partnership opportunities at RTD, so the RTD should um, clearly identify, clearly identify, and communicate guidelines for partnerships. Yes, uh, that's why you get the big bucks, Elise. Yeah. <laughs> when does that start? <laughs> okay, go ahead, Red. I think I think the other thing might be useful for these notes is to reference. The way that Dr. Cog does it, because they have a pretty clear process. Yeah. And sometimes in, in trying to say this is what we need, it's it's useful to reference something that is, or another group that really does it well. So just a little add on to that. The other thing is that I mentioned was the idea that any partnership needs to be clear in what its goals are. And uh, I find that sometimes partnerships tend to thrash around and become less effective if they don't have a real clear, this is why we are partnering. Mm -hmm. We and could kind of potentially incorporate. Point, right, where, you know, we wanna make sure that we're evaluating success. Mm -hmm. And it could be to uh, kind of combine. I think Elise was starting to say this, it could be the metrics are ridership, cost efficiency, you know, um, service to equity and um, underserved communities, uh, first and last mile connections. Um, there could be similar, like similarly, as you apply for different TIP projects, I would think uh, RTD could identify where they want to where they feel they would benefit from partnerships. So if, if you know, if I was, if I, and I'd love to hear what, what Lynn's thoughts are um, about something like that, where are there, are there categories of partnerships that you guys have already identified that you want to explore? And I'll stop, Elise, go ahead. You, or whoever, not, not me. After Lynn. No, you go ahead, Lisa. I'll think about it here for a sec. Um, <laughs> I like that idea. You could include in Jackie's bullet, RTD should identify and communicate the guidelines and goals for partnerships so that everyone has consistent and equitable access to these opportunities. Such goals might include the ones you just mentioned and other ones identified by RTD to recognize we may not have captured them all. And the other point that I wanted to make was something completely different, which is 
I don't know if we're ready to switch topics, but the intro paragraph references our recommendations for the use of COVID-19 relief funding. I wanna expand this to other federal funding that is coming down the pike, which we yes. have not su submitted separate recommendations for that we also would like RTD to use to facilitate partnerships. So I would just encourage us to change that wording to say, and other federal funding and other available federal funding. Okay, Doug. Well, I just say, Elise, um, that 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 in the intro is making a specific reference to the to the um, recommendations that you did that you made. So in the so we can do it in the fourth bullet here. It says as more federal funds oh, available. Okay, these partnership opportunities. Okay, that's fine. They they don't all have to be quote unquote relief funds. They could be in infrastructure funds. I just don't want to limit ourselves to CRISA. Gotcha. I can remove relief or maybe put an additional word in there. Yeah, thanks. And I'll just, you know, answering uh, Jackie's question, I'm not quite sure uh, what exactly the, I think it's a good idea to have some, some set criteria and it may be something that Deborah or somebody else on the, on the call could answer better than I do, but I'm not sure. It, I don't believe we have set criteria at this point. If I may interject, we should have some element of criteria because there are certain things to which we must adhere as it relates to service equity, fair equity, and things of the like. So that's something that's sort of inherent in reference to what we do, but I think we can do a better job of communicating that out having listened to the conversation, because I think people just may not be aware of the varying parameters that we utilize in making an informed decision about how we would partner. So I think if anything, we'd be remiss not to qualify that we have to look through an equity lens as it relates to any type of Title VI compliance uh, aspect. Thanks. All right, thank you. Any other recommendations for um, these partnership recommendations, anything else that folks wanted to tweak? All right, so I think we got some more good feedback, which is great. Um, and then so um, let's add those suggestions to this as well. And we could bring this forward to the next step. Um, but I think we're, we're getting really close here. So that's great. Julie, can I just ask a question in terms of process? So yes, um, ma'am. Once we get these recommendations, it sounds like this this was the final review. Are we bringing this to the full committee at the May eighth meeting, or is the goal to bring it back to this committee for review again? What is your process idea, Doug? I think originally we were thinking about sending them to the May eighth meeting, but if we correct, I, I, does that work for folks? Okay. Yeah, I've definitely, that's what we plan. All recommendations that we have to date, we had talked about packaging those and, and having them available for the full committee next week. Um, yeah. Dea, so, so there, this partnership recommendation draft is also part of your, your operations agenda. So I'll update this based on the comments today and you'll have the latest and greatest. Um, Perfect. Great, thank you. That's great. Yeah, thanks Doug for doing that. I appreciate it. Okay, all right, so let's move on to our next conversation um, around the RTD service area recommendations. So again, you had a great conversation about um, service area and what does this look like? And we really talked about how um, since reimagined RTD is gonna be focusing on this, maybe just some, some questions um, or thoughts <laughs> that we could send on to reimagine RTD um, would be the best approach. Um, and so those are available in your packet. Um, and so questions or comments about um, this, some of these, I guess, questions or ideas um, to bring forward specific to the, um, to the service area. One of the first things I was curious about is how will, or I guess the question that I had is how will be, what will be the process for right sizing and evaluating over time? Um, I thought you guys had a great conversation about, you know, making sure we're right sizing, making sure that 
there's like a minimum service level be obtained. Um, but you know, we're going to be expanding over time. How, you know, what is that going to look like? Um, when it comes to right sizing, that was a, an additional question I was thinking about. Other thoughts? Okay. Well, I guess I was thinking the right size comment had to do with the fact that um, certain areas may be appropriate for micro transit or other innovative services that in areas that are um, not dense enough to really justify or fully use a fixed route system, for example. So what I don't know is a minimum service level almost sounds like, gee, everybody should get bus service at this level. And I think we should just make sure that um, the concept of minimum service could change depending on the, say, the density of population or the nature of the population, um, the type of mobility provided, as well as the level of service of that mobility type. Mm -hmm. Does okay. that make sense? Uh, that wasn't very articulate, but. No, at least the only other thing is, I, I also think maybe the people being served should also be included. So is it is the goal of this minimum level of service to provide trips for seniors or people who are transit dependent or equity populations? Should there be some service standard that we're making sure that if you're within the RTD district and you need to get to a doctor's appointment or a health and human services office or veteran services or something like that, that there's a way for you to get it, even if it's, even if it's a cab, I, and I don't know this, but you know, a cab and then you get reimbursed. You know what I mean? If you're traveling with, if you live in RTD and are living within the, you know, I, I don't know that that's even a good idea. That's, but to me, the level of service, minimum service level also is dependent on, there are people who need this service more than others. I think that's a good point where I get a little bit unsure of is at a super, super sparsely populated corner of the district, we still want seniors to get to doctor's appointments. It may be that that really isn't fair to saddle RTD with that burden. It could be that that's a human service equity, uh, human service responsibility. Maybe RTD helps out, but that's where I think it's fair for RTD to say, we need some contributions because this is, we need a partnership in order to meet that level of need because it's not mass transit, it's, it's something different. Um, which is, I agree, which is why then I would say RTD should partner. That's a partnership opportunity in my mind. So if you're in those, and do you devote more monies to those lower densities? Is there a different bucket of dollars for those lower density right. areas where partnership dollars exist? So RTD is saying, we know we can't give you that service. We're going to give you this bucket of money. You come up with the service that and access our dollars and deliver it, right? I mean, to me, that's a perfect partnership opportunity. I agree. And we might want to explicitly call that out. And I think we also, um, here I go defending RTD. I think we need to recognize that some levels of um, service for seniors, people with disability, other transit reliant populations that are that have sort of unique needs in a very sparsely populated area in particular, we might need to um, make the recommendation that we find other pots of funding because that's really more human services. That there just need to be other contributions into the system because that's high cost, high touch service. And that may be beyond RTD's capability. So they contribute, but they may not be fully responsible. I would agree with that. I just think if you're within the RTD service area, you should have some access to something. And I think it would make the communities who say, we don't get service, like you do get service. This and your service is in partnership dollars potentially. Yeah. It's a complicated thing though, because you have to figure out how you balance the economics of something like that. I mean, there are very remote parts of 
of RTD districts that having, you know, giving the impression that, that we will get you to the doctor at Anschutz whenever you need is, is something, in, especially considering the struggles that RTD is faced with economically, uh, I'm, I, would, I would be cautious and thoughtful about how anything like that got implemented or got recommended. I agree, Red. Right? It's not so, and it, with, with Elise's comments, it's not solely RTD's responsibility to accomplish that. What I think makes good sense is that RTD have partnership money available and to say, look, we are providing you access to some service, right? And you need to work with us to make it a robust service to meet the needs of your community. Um, so, and I don't, and you're right, you have to budget it, but they budget for expensive paratransit service now and other levels of service. And, and I think, I guess I'm somewhat, um, I appreciate the concerns of parts of the community that feel that they do not get served, but yet they're paying into it, right? So I, I don't, I, I completely agree it's complicated and this is, but I think it's something that should be explored by the RTD, reimagine RTD. So that's more the direction I'm giving is like, look at that as you evaluate right sizing your service. I like to look at it. that approach. I also like the, the the approach of just saying, just call your local mayor and- Yeah, which is what they do. They're like, <laughs> I'm paying you. And my favorite is when they're not even my, they're like, you can work with RTD and they don't even live in Lone Street. They're like, <laughs> Parker calls me, Highlands Ranch calls me. <laughs> My son Jeff sometimes gets calls about not having their trash picked up. You know? oh, oh, I get those calls too. Yeah. Oh my God, I was, don't even get me started. Yeah. I guess, Julie, if I can just base on the conversation as I, I have kind of been listening to folks and looking back at the questions that were up for discussion. In the first bullet point, it almost seems like we need to revise the, the, the second question around are there minimum level of service? If so, and those minimums cannot be reached, should those areas be removed? Because it almost seems like what we're saying is if those areas, if the minimum cannot be provided and no partnership can be established to meet some sort of minimum viable product, then should we explore removing the RTD boundary? At least that's how I'm hearing the conversation. I don't know how others feel about that, but the way it reads right now, it's almost like, just cut the cord one or the other. Like if, if we can't provide any service, even in partnership, then we can't have that, like explore that conversation. At least that's how I read it. I don't know if others have um, a different read. Well, and I think it kind of goes back to, you know, if, if you know, you're not, allowed, you're not able to provide service and there's no partnership that could be established, then what's the point of you paying into RTD essentially of, you know, why are we collecting your money if we can't provide you with anything at all? Um, so yeah, that's how I was kind of reading it as well. Other thoughts? Go ahead, Dan. I have a, have a question. What is the process for including or removing territory from RTD? Is that the legislature? Is it a vote? How, do, how does that happen? Anyone know specifically? I think there was an effort underway by, I don't know if it was Douglas Parker, County or somewhere Parker, down there. They they it. Yeah. They Legislatively, we want to be removed from, from that serve from RTD's region and not have to pay taxes. But uh, that was, they walked yeah. away from that it event. Looks like Lynn has something to add. Because Lynn, Lynn, I think, is probably more knowledgeable. Yes. <laughs> Following the Parker uh, situation and, and some others, that uh, they were uh, there was a bill in the legislature that would have allowed Parker to put it on the ballot and have people vote whether they wanted to get out or not. And um, uh, I think even in the bill, it recognized that that they would uh, would not get out till 2050. They would still be re responsible for the debt that had uh, been incurred um, up until that point. So. Uh, it's not a simple process, and, and as I think Julie said, it was, or uh, maybe Jackie said that it was pulled, um, the bill was, was uh, uh, dropped for now. <laughs> well, 
you know, we have outlying communities uh, we largely serve that Highway 82 and the I-70 corridors. Uh, but uh, for example, Redstone, that's 20 miles away from Carbondale, uh, where we have a lot of service available, but people drive down, they park in the parking lot lots, they catch our bus services there. So just because somebody doesn't have uh, paratransit in their community, they don't have a fixed route running around it. I mean, the density wouldn't really support that level of service. Uh, they're still being able to access other services that RTD has created where they can drive and park and ride and go into town and so forth. Yeah, I think that's an important part, right? It's not like it's not like our boundaries are really set in stone. We have people who flow in and out um, to seek service. Um, and so I think that's an important thing to consider in this, you know, service area conversation is one, can you even get out? Two, you know, remember that, you know, you have residents who are, are driving to, to catch service that could be a little further away, but it's still something that they're benefiting from. So it's going to be, it's going to have to be an interesting conversation with this RTD reimagined group. So, and, and unfortunately we, we don't have the time <laughs> To, to cover it here in this accountability committee. Um, and so is there any other specifications or specifics that we wanna to add to these questions to really make sure that we're, we're providing, I guess, the structure of the conversation we wish we could have now? Well, I think Lynn made a good point and that is that RTD has pledged sales taxes against bonds potentially in these communities that are maybe underserved or not being served and uh, they will not be able to get out or quit paying at least uh, those sales taxes until that debt is gone. And it sounds like that's 2050. So it, it just seems like, you know, the references to, you know, I can see maybe adding more territory, but removing it at this point seems kind of like a moot point. Really? Yeah, go ahead. Just real quick to Dan's point. Um, you know, Dan, uh, Bill Saroy, I believe at the last meeting, he said he, he mentioned that part of the Reimagine RTD, there will be a conversation specific about, um, you know, the contraction and expansion of the RTD boundary. That's one of the, the tasks associated with, with Reimagine RTD. So, you know, I think these questions kind of fall in line with that, regardless of some of the financial complications associated with that, um, just to have a more policy-driven discussion about what that looks like. So just kind of FYI. I'll just say one more thing that that's just sort of a side that here is that, you know, there was a recent article about uh, how all of the suburbs and more outlying areas are becoming both ethnically and economically more diverse, um, which could raise even more challenges as we move forward. Agreed, yeah, actually really looking at, you know, meeting those needs of those underserved communities is gonna be a, a continuous challenge, especially as those folks, as those areas continue to diversify, um, it's gonna be an, an interesting conversation and, and how it evolves over time. And how do we continue to meet that and and include that in the analysis of you know what does that minimum service level or partnerships look like are we making sure that we're looking at you know community diversity community needs um to making sure that we're, we're still engaging in the appropriate partnerships um to meet that community okay anything else on this item before we move on. If you do have any other thoughts, please reach out um, as you go about your week, Jackie. If there's anything new you want to add, just <laughs> reach out and let us know. Um, and we could continue that conversation as that comes back to, this will also come back, right, Doug, to the entire committee on May 10th. It will. And and, and I'll make the adjustment. Um, I thought Daya summarized it pretty, pretty well, exactly what that... Right. Well, it should look like that second question. So we'll make that adjustment. 
Okay, thank you so much. All right, so moving on to our next agenda item, which is actually going to be a report out from the North Highlands um, Consulting Group. So um, one thing we may go over a little bit on this item, I wanna make sure that there's time for discussion. So if folks are willing to hang on for an extra five or 10 minutes, I'd really appreciate it. Um, but I do wanna make sure that we, we get enough time for our consultants to to share their report and then um, have a, a meaty discussion about it. So Doug, would you like to introduce the group? Well, just for time, I might just turn it directly over to Tanya from North Highlands and, and she'll introduce the topic and some of the uh, peer comparison work that she had done. Um, okay, looking great, thank you. thank you so much for being here, Tanya. Great, thank you for having us today. I'm also accompanied by Anna Daniger. Um, so she's going to uh, participate in this discussion as well. We do have a slide deck. I'm going to go ahead and share um, share my screen with you all. And um, you know, can can you all see that? I'll put it in presentation mode. It should make it a little cleaner. All right. Is that in, is that in a way you all can all see? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so in the interest of time, we can cover some of these um, some of these topics in a little bit of a, at a higher level um, and really get to the findings, which is kind of the meat of why we're here today, um, and then um, have that have that discussion and, and get your feedback. So Anna and I, hello again. Um, also want to uh, mention our uh, our colleague Julia Grissett, who did much of the research that um, fed this analysis. Um, she's unable to join us today, but certainly a thank you to her for her work. Um, so a little bit about what we were asked to do and how we went about it. Um, you know, we were asked to conduct a high level assessment of peer agencies um, and their governance structure for, um, for this governance subcommittee. And we're here today um, really on activity number two there, having this um, facilitated discussion with the subcommittee based on the findings that we have thus far. And we'll use this uh, conversation um, and that sort of that last phase you see analyze where um, you know, we're gonna get your feedback and, and then draft recommendations. We want to see what's resonating with you um, and, and you know, hear out any, any thoughts you have before actually creating those. So um, you know, we did start uh, by selecting 10 peer agencies, uh, did a, a deep dive on publicly available data on those agencies um, and then kind of analyze to see, hey, what, what makes RTD unique and, and what ways is RTD similar to their peers? Um, so when we selected the peer agencies, we took into account population of the area, um, geographic size, the different modes that are operated by the agencies. Um, and we also want to account for the amount of service. So we incorporated um, service miles and service vehicles. And we also did uh, look through your, your subcommittee's uh, previous work to see what other agencies you had looked at and what had resonated with you before um, to see if there was any alignment there. Um, and ultimately um, landed on these 10 agencies. So, you know, what did we look at? Um, you know, we looked at, you know, how many board members those agencies all had um, and, you know, what kind of services provided by the area. Um, we uh, looked at term durations. So how long are folks serving on the board and how are they selected? We looked at the different board structures, specifically the different types of committees um, that, that boards had. Um, and then we looked at community involvement. So you know, what ways um, are community um, folks uh, engaged with the board, um, either through subcommittees or, or what have you? And we also compared compensation um, and then finally, we looked at transparency. And so, you know, how are um, materials available to the public? Um, and are there methods of, uh, of, of community participation within board meetings? And so let's, let's get a little bit more into the findings here. Um, there's um, in the packet, the full preliminary report has been included. So there's more detail on all of that if you'd like to see that. Um, but happy to, to take questions on that um, here at the end. If, um, but really want to focus today on, on what we found. So, um, you know, RTD um, did share uh, some commonalities, of course, with, with their peer agencies. Um, that included peer, um, I'm sorry, that included term durations. We found anywhere between one and five years was, was kind of the standard on average. Um, you know, it was about three years. 
So RTD's board uh, durations are four years. Um, and RTD also staggers those terms um, so that there isn't a full turnover at any one time, um, really maintaining some consistency um, through, through those um, through new membership, uh, which is really just a best practice. Um, we also found that, you know, comparatively, the board is compensated on par with their peer agencies. Um, no, many agencies compensated per meeting. Um, RTD compensates per year, um, so it runs about a thousand, it's a thousand dollars a month. Um, but when you look at the number of board meetings um, that could be attended anywhere from a handful up to eight, um, RTD, you know, say say a board member attends eight uh, board meetings, they're they're getting one hundred twenty five dollars for that board meeting, which really puts them on par, right, with their peers between that 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 up to zero to two hundred dollars. It's really what we found. Um, and then in terms of transparency and public participation, again, RTD is on par with its with its peers here. Board meetings are open to the public. Materials are posted online. Um, that includes agenda, minutes, um, any board packets, um, as well as video of proceedings. Um, and then RTD also includes a public comment period, as did most of the, um, as do most of the boards. Um, boards range between, you know, uh, uh, an unlimited amount of time for public participation to as few as 15 minutes. So um, again, RTD is really on par with its peers here. There are some ways in which RTD is unique, um, and one of those is that board members are elected. So of the 10 agencies we reviewed, with the exception of King County Transit, RTD is the only um, peer agency that does elect their board members. In the case of King County Transit, um, they are governed by elected county commissioners who govern, um, who, who oversee the governance of, um, of King County Transit um, as part of their regular responsibilities. So that, that was rather unique there. Um, and we also found that the appointments here um, were often reflective of you know, any sub-regional or regional model. And you can see what we'll talk a little bit more about that um, down below. But you know, um, whether they're kind of gov uh, more governed at the state or regional level, such as counties. Um, and then also, you know, we saw the variations in districts. Um, or even municipality representation as well. We also found that compared to other agencies, RTD's board is uh, rather large. Um, so the average of the peers we looked at, the, the average was 11.6 board members. Um, but when you compare RTD's service size, um, as well as you know, number, number of folks served in the area and number of square miles, RTD has, um, you know, RTD boards represent both fewer constituents and fewer square miles than their peer agencies. And then just again, another note on the regional sub regional representation, um, it's unique across the board. Um, you know, it, it, there's very little consistency shown here. Um, you know, there are a variety of options, <laughs> a variety of, of, of means of going about this here. Um, as I said, from you know more of a regional representation to district level representation, including municipalities, um, as well as a hybrid approach and blending sort of sort of all of those. So those are those are our high level findings, and um, really want to kind of share and, and talk today about this sort of what does it look like going forward, um, you know, and some things to consider. So, you know, uh, the board size and regional representation. You know, does it make sense to align um, RTD's board size with its peers, you know, in similar geographic um, region or geographic space and uh, population? Um, and then, you know, incorporating um, regional representation and some sort of a hybrid approach, is, is that the right thing to do here? Um, you know, enabling, which, which could enable more stakeholder engagement, but also, you know, that regional, that state and regional representation can also build trust um, across the region and within the state. Um, then some, some things to think about in terms of participation and transparency. Um, so, you know, RTD is in alignment with other transit agencies in terms of public participation, um, but there could be an opportunity to set a new standard here. 
Um, so I, I understand that, you know, uh, sub-regional service councils is a recommendation that, that is being made. Um, so is that an opportunity to um, improve, or, or improve public participation and um, transparency? You know, we saw a variety of sizes and these different types of, um, you know, committees and um, service councils all the way from, you know, as small as nine folks and all the way up to 49 people. So there, there really is a, a lot of, of variation here. Um, but really the purpose of, you know, those, those councils is you know to kind of see to the day-to-day -day matters and allow the board to focus on kind of shaping that strategic direction um, of, of RTD. And so uh, another thought here is you know RTD board material is all online, as is with other agencies. But as with all agencies, it's cumbersome and difficult to navigate. So what means um, would RT could RTD take to to make that information a little bit more? Um, accessible. And then finally appointment. Um, so, you know, as we said, RTD was the only board that we looked at, which is publicly elected. Um, so that means that RTD board members are then held accountable to their local constituents, um, which can result in, you know, board members losing that higher level, that strategic direction. Um, so if board members were to be appointed, um, they would be held accountable to the appointee and to RTD itself. And then if that's coupled with service uh, councils, would they really be able to manage those details that, um, you know, that the, that the board, you know, freeing up the board to kind of see to, to, the, um, to the big strategic direction. Um, so I know that went a little bit quickly, but I do want to be cognizant of time and leave a lot of a uh, room for your feedback here. We, um, you know, these are our findings, um, but what we really want to hear from you is, you know, what out of all of this resonates um, and, and, and brings something for you that, that comes to mind. Um, so I'll open the floor now to the, to the subcommittee. Great. Great, thank you for that overview. And of course it was in our packet. So um, feel free to reference the, the preliminary report as needed. Um, let's open up um, the conversation. Does anybody have any direct questions for Tanya and team at this time? Any clarification? Um, I don't know if it, Go ahead. it's for Tanya, Tanya and the team. I'm sorry, I thought you were pointing at me, but that's Zoom, so. Um, last time we had this conversation, I, I think several folks voiced what problem are we trying to solve and, and what does improve effectiveness look like? And so maybe this is a question for Tanya. Um, rather than asking how does RTD differ from others, um, whether or not there's a best practice that results in an enhancement that you've discovered I t my views on the RTD board, I will say, depends on who's on the RTD board. In the past, we've had board members who were anti-transit and not so very collaborative. And I thought we should throw the bums out and we should have fewer of them, they should be appointed. And the current board I think is actually very collaborative and positive and, and working well and, and aligned with trying to make good change. And so I'm kind of like, well, board's not the problem. So I guess, it's to the group and to Tanya in terms of what problem are we trying to solve by making adjustments to the board? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. Thank you for that. And, and our feedback that we had heard about our TD board was that they tend to spend some time in the weeds of the day to day and that that strategic direction does get lost. Um, and so I think that's kind of, you know, the appointment piece of that, um, you know, if, if folks are appointed, are they then kind of able to, you know, be held accountable as opposed to a constituent, they be, they're held accountable to, uh, you know, the appointing committee and RTD itself. But also, you know, is it that they're in the day to day so much because they don't have the support that they need, in which case this, um, you know, sub regional Council or service council would could be of, of good assistance to them so that they can again maintain that strategic vision and, and allow the the support of the community and um, that sort of day to day. 
But, but I'll, I'll chime in. I, I agree with you, um, Tanya. And um, we didn't decide to start looking at, <laughs> looking at this because we thought there was a problem. So I think, um, you know, that's, there's probably some um, initiation of this sort of a review in your prior um, conversations uh, that, would, that would answer that question as well. Well, and I think I was one of the people that brought it up. I do think a 15 member board, it, at least it seemed to me was a little unwieldy and probably not the most efficient and based on what the work that they've done. So that's the problem in my, in my opinion. And I think it created parochial decision-making instead of transformative big picture regional thinking. And I'm not talking about this particular board. I'm talking about over the, you know, 16 years that I've been involved in local, 16 plus years I've been involved in local government, looking at a variety of different boards of RTD. So when I hear that, um, that, that the model, that what the RTD structure is different in the number of constituents represented and the square miles represented and that, um, that RTDs are smaller in comparison to our peers, that makes me think there might be something to what my initial Kind of outcome my initial thinking was having been exposed to rtd not a particular board of rtd but rtd the institution over the last 16 plus years and uh, one of the real concerns i have is the ability to be not with this particular board so please this isn't about an individual it's about uh to be strategic in your decision making and and um use of very limited precious resources when you are uh, continually going back to a constituency to say what you've brought back, which is why I think we've elected sometimes board members who are anti-transit because they ran on a ballot of, we're not getting any service and it's all about me, me, me. And that sounded good. Like, oh yeah, somebody go down there and fight for my service versus somebody go down there and think big picture about our region and how, how um, a transit district can add value uh, to all of us. So I am, I am very much interested in, in, in looking at a, a, a smaller board numbers that represent a larger geographic area. So there's folks that care about serving urban people and suburban and exurban, um, which I don't necessarily, they can't do that if all they do is represent downtown Denver and a very dense group of city. So that's, I was one of the people, so thanks. Mm -hmm. So a quick question I have, um, if, and Lynn, I'll just get to you in just one second. Um, is who is our audience for this recommendation, right? Is this going to RTD and is it, we're gonna ask RTD's board to reevaluate themselves? Or is the audience of this specific recommendation different in that we're actually asking our legislature to do something different? I'm, I'm just, it would help me, I think, figure out where we need to go. We could think about our, what our audience is. Um, hold on that thought for a second, and then let's jump to Lynn. Go ahead, Lynn, jump in. Okay, although if Dan looks like he might want to, Dan looks like he might want to say something, I'd be interested in what he has to say, and then I, I have a couple of comments. Okay, Dan, yeah, if you have your hand up, go ahead and jump in. Are, are we talking about this, Dan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, we have a whole different system, and we, we, uh, uh, our, our member jurisdictions uh, appoint elected officials uh, to uh, be on the board of our transportation authority. Um, so, and that works pretty well. Uh, some board members are more active and engaged than others, obviously. I don't know that there's a perfect system, but... Uh, uh, it does seem a bit unwieldy with uh, 15 board members. And, you know, the transportation bill that's working its th the way through the legislature right now is also uh, creating the ability for uh, there to be transportation planning organizations 
that are going to have boards and be able to levy taxes and so forth. And so it's just another layer of government that's going to be added potentially into this whole mix with sub-regional councils, transportation planning organizations, metropolitan planning organizations, and so forth. And it just seems like it creates a lot of overlap and, and uh, duplication, possibly. But I didn't really have anything I wanted to say. So thank you. So I will jump in. It's a, it's a topic that I was, first time it came around, I was a little hesitant to jump in on because I don't want to sound defensive. Um, but I do think, you know, I've probably given this more thought than, um, than most people here um, by virtue of, you know, working on and these things. I'm going to take one second, though, to tell you that the uh, uh, Accountability Committee bill passed out of the Senate this morning, 23 to 11. So it's on the way to the governor's desk, um, just to give you that update. Uh, this is, I think, some some interesting work, some good work. Um, I, I think there, I, I would point out a couple of factual issues here. One is that um, it talks about a 2.3 million dollar popula 2.3 million population. Um, I think that must be the 2010 Denver Aurora UZA, which excludes several other UZAs that are including all of my area. Um, uh, I think it's more like the number that I see is 3.1 million, 3.08. Um, so that uh, it is a higher number that each board member represents. It's more like 180,000. And then I think Dan's comment is, um, if you look at some of the, and I haven't looked at all of these different boards that were peer reviewed, but I know that for instance, LA Metro, the mayor is the um, chair of the board and all of the county board of supervisors sits on them. So they are elected officials. They're just not elected to the board. And I think that's the case in other places, but uh, I think- That's not true. I'm they're sorry? not all elected. No, no, they're not all, but the, the county supervisors do sit on there, right? Yes, LA County Board of Supervisors, there's five, and then there's the mayor and mayoral appointees, and then there's there's another representative from outside the area who's an elected official in the broader service area outside of LA County. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm, I would go back to uh, uh, Elisa's question is, you know, what's the problem to be solved and how do you solve it? Is it, And um, also Julie's question, the reason it's elected right now, the board was, I think originally, although it's gone back and forth, I think originally appointed in 1980, a statewide ballot issue said that they wanted it to be elected. And uh, so the, the audience that you were asking about would be the legislature to take it. Well, I guess the legislature could change it itself, but it, it wouldn't be to the board. But um, where I guess uh, I really um, would push back a little bit is in terms of, of this idea that everybody is is uh, making parochial decisions, for one thing, uh, and you know, I'm not saying 15 is the perfect number. It's, it, it can be hard to make decisions um, with 15. Although I think we have a, a a solution underway that may help with that. And um, but uh, I do think that when people, it's it's like I said at some earlier meeting. We're like legislators or any other elected representative that we represent our area, but I think we also have a broader view, all of us, of the good of the of the uh, agency. And right now, we're involved in a strategic planning process, uh, recovery process for how to bring people back uh, after COVID, uh, reimagine RTD. So there, are, you know, a lot of high level processes going on. But just to give you some examples of uh, recent decisions, um, in addition to bringing in an interim and, uh, and current CEO from outside that, uh, you know, to run the agency, um, you know, there was the big article on uh, the fact that, that uh, when RTG passed its, uh, its COVID, when we cut service, uh, this says 31%, it was 40% somewhere in there, but that uh, low income routes had a 13% smaller reduction compared to higher income routes and minority routes had a 29% smaller reduction than non-minority routes. So we were focused on, uh, honestly, we were focused on a lot of the, the central routes that served the people that were needing to get to work and needing um, transit, even though it uh, uh, meant higher cuts in our own areas. Um, another example, um, the was the unanimous decision 
the, um, to temporarily halt contributions to the Fast Track's internal savings account, even though there are members who are in areas where there are unfinished corridors, but it was looking at the, uh, the finances of the district. Um, so I'm not sure that appointing people, I'm not sure that the problem is, is, is to the degree that I'm hearing um, here. I think that, that uh, um, people are, we get on the board and generally, really almost I'd say overall, uh, people are focused on the good of the, um, the district. And um, the, the thing that we're doing right now to help with that decision-making is that there is a proposal to go to smaller committees that seems to be getting a lot of support on the board. We haven't taken it up to make a final decision yet, but I think that that would help with some of the um, issues around making, making decisions as a larger group. So, thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Hey, it's Jackie. I'm sorry. I, I'm supposed. I'm already supposed to be on a five o'clock call, but I. This is really important, so I just wanted to make Go this ahead. comment. This isn't about a board member or a particular board being parochial. I think a 15 member board lends itself to being parochial. I think it lends itself to to making decisions with smaller constituencies. It's like having wards within a large city. And um, instead of, you know, have ward one, what am I bringing back to ward one or ward five? What am I bringing back to ward five? Instead of what is my whole city looking like with everybody focused on what is my whole city looking like? And I recognize the value in having both. I still think 15 is way too large and I would love to explore uh, shrinking that board down, size down to, to something in the 11, 12 range. Cause I think for the efficiency of staff, the efficiency of staffing it, bringing the people together and getting decision making a smaller board would be of value to at least explore. I'm not, and that's where I stand. So again, I hate to like say that and then ditch it, but I'll listen, I'll try and listen to the recordings and thanks everybody for your allowing me to speak again. Sorry, Julie, thanks. Thanks, Bye. Jackie. <laughs> she did like a quick mic drop and then she like darted, okay. Um, other thoughts? I want to hear from some other members about your thoughts around the conversation so far, opening it up to the group. Julie, this is Dea. I, I think one of the questions that I, and I see it on the slide that I am I'm kind of wrestling with is, um, you know, it, assuming that the service council's uh, recommendation moves forward, assuming that it's implemented, it does really open us up to rethink how the board is structured in a way to serve or to continue serving in, in a very strategic sense and guiding the, the, the um, direction of the organization and, and not being in, at, in the weeds as much possibly. I mean, who knows? Um, you know, it, it, I think that's just kind of where I'm, I'm a little stuck in figuring out, well, it's a little bit of, I think for me, a chicken and an egg situation, although we can kind of design it a recommendation any way that we, we would like to at this point. You know, I, I just want to echo a, a comment that I know I've made um, in previous meetings around the elected board um, and that I know it's a really important piece, especially for a lot of the constituents and communities that we, we represent. A lot of folks want to have that kind of democratic representation, but it can look a lot of different ways. Um, I think we just have to think about whether 15 is the right number um, and is that really the, the way that we get to it. I think the other thing that I just want to lift up and Lynn, it's, it's good to hear that you all are, are rethinking the committee structures um, and how that might better serve RTD. But at the end of the day, the board is the board, right? The committee's report to the board. So that the number I think is where we have to figure out what's the right balance and what the right composition is. Thank you. Any other thoughts people want to weigh in on this issue? So we are over six minutes it looks like for my computer. Um, and so one of the reasons why I asked about who our audience is for this recommendation is because I think it could help us try and figure out one, well, first we need to decide if there is a recommendation we wanna make and two, what would that recommendation look like? And so what it seems like to me is that if the legislature is our audience, you know, 
this this obviously needs to be unpacked. Um, and would the recommendation be if we were to make one something along the lines of like, you know, this should be something that the legislature should con consider, you know, doing a study on or something next session, um, you know, uh, something around those lines, because obviously, well, how do you define success, I think, is, is going to be an issue is how do you define effectiveness? Um, would a, 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 a nine member board be better? Um, and how do you determine that based off of, you know, some of the other case findings? And so um, just trying to think about, you know, what would the frame of this recommendation look like? Um, I, I, I don't know. It, it's going to be a tough one. Um, do, do folks have any specific questions or additional information that we need from staff or the consultants to further this conversation next? Julie, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, just one qualifying question. You know, we're known as one of the largest landmass districts in the country, the size approximately of the state of Delaware. Um, <clears throat> does that matter whether we have nine or 11 or 15 or 20 board members? Perhaps not, but I just found the statement from uh, North Highland kind of strange in that there are some demands from that kind of geography for representation, I think. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. I, I don't have a particular comment, but I just found that kind of interesting. So, so okay. if, if I may, um, in response to both the population and geographic size, um, we did use um, UDA population and UDA square miles. So that does skew the results a bit, but we did that for the purpose of peer-to-peer -peer comparison. Um, so the, the um, UZA for all of those 10 agencies, both in population and miles, is what was used for that calculation, if that helps clarify things. Great, thank you so much. Um, did I see anyone else wanting to jump in? Elise, did I see your hand? Okay, great. Um, I, just, I was just curious, um, Lynn alluded to uh, the history of changes to election of the board. I wonder if there's any historical write-up that exists on any any history of changes to the board that we should know before we attempt to reinvent the wheel. Um, I don't. Surely it must be written down somewhere. I just don't know. Particularly on the elected versus appointed, it seems like that we might have the benefit of knowing our history better. I thought Doug had that early in the meeting notes from way back when, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Troy, I think it was more just a statement than anything, but but uh, but I can I can check around at least and see if we can find anything. Um, I think RTD has that. Yeah. It yeah. seems like it must be somewhere. I just think it might inform, help us dust off our memories or learn new things about. Yeah what's been tried in the past and what worked and what didn't. Okay, yeah, I think that that could be really helpful. Um, all right, so we are 10 minutes over and I don't wanna keep folks longer than I asked them to already extend. Um, any final thoughts or feedback to this group um, that any members have? Okay. So let's wrap it up here. We have a lot more conversation to do. So we'll, we'll continue this on our next um, call. And if you guys do have any other questions or any other information that you guys want to hear from Tanya or um, from Dr. Cox staff, please just let us know um, so that we can incorporate that in the next packet. So thank you all for, for starting this conversation. Thank you, Tanya and your team for your hard work and your presentation today. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for the um, really robust conversation and let's continue it. So, all right, Thanks. have a good evening. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.